Good evening, everyone. Um, this is Elsa De Silva logging in from Mumbai, India. I hope you're doing well during COVID-19. We are locked down in our homes. And um, thank you once again for joining us. This is the fourth episode of our series called Inclusive Cities, which Prathama and I are doing as part of our alumni network at the Stanford's Center for Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. Hi, Prathama. How are you? I'm very well. And uh, hello again. Welcome to this Inclusive Cities series. I'm Prathama. And it's day 18 of the lockdown here in India. Um, are you all feeling nostalgic of our normal life before this <laughs> pandemic? Tell us. And uh, we'd love to hear how you're feeling in in the comment box um, under your videos and use the comment box to also ask us questions. And going back to nostalgia, isn't it so easy to take so many mundane everyday things of our life for granted, like our public space, our parks and streets. I know many of us are appreciating and craving our public space now that it has been taken away from us. Today, we have two amazing women on this panel to talk about the fate of our public spaces. Uh, so Lakshana Mahajan and Nidhi Gulati. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi, Pratima. So Lakshana Hi. is a researcher on urban issues. Uh, she's consulted on uh, uh, urban issues at various places, including at uh, Mumbai Transformation Support Unit, which was the erstwhile think tank on urban affairs for government of Maharashtra. She's also translated architect Jan Gell's seminal book on public spaces to uh, Marathi, which I recommend that you look at. Uh, Nidhi Golati uh, is uh, joining us today from uh, New York, which seems to be at the heart of this crisis at the moment. She's the senior director at Project for Public Spaces, which is a pioneering institution that we all look up to uh, when thinking about place making or public realm. So welcome to both of you. Uh, my question, my first question is uh, for Nidhi. Uh, Nidhi, how are you doing and how has the public spaces in your city changed during this pandemic, especially given that you're based in New York and it is the hot spot of this pandemic uh, at the moment? I'm, I'm doing well, thank you for asking, uh, Pratima. It's, uh, the public spaces are really something else right now in New York. You know, our streets are quiet. It's really heartbreaking to see that. Um, but it's definitely the right thing to do, you know, uh, because we need to be staying indoors. We need to be staying away. And uh, New York is not in a full state of uh, lockdown. The essential functions of the city are still working. But the idea of what is essential has changed. You know, majority of our space, um, even in, in a city like New York, that is known to be very walkable and has a lot of parks, even in a city like New York, a majority of our public space is usually given over to automobiles and cars and things like that, and they're not moving. So what you're seeing right now is that that public space is being reclaimed by people doing other kinds of things, places where sidewalks are really narrow, people are stepping into the street and people are actually using that to social distance from each other. The idea of uh, desire lines is changing. The idea of distance is changing. It's more important for people to quickly and safely get to their grocery store, get to their pharmacy and get to their park to sit out for five minutes. Um, and it's not so important to get five, 10, 15 miles away um, from their homes. Some places are deserted and others have gained a lot of popularity depending on their proximity to people's homes. So proximity to your home is much more important now than proximity to work. So that entire concept of um, proximity has changed in New York City. So in some ways it's, um, it's heartening, in some ways it's very disheartening, but it's definitely very different from what it, what it was a month ago. So Lakshna, uh, you know, New York and Bombay are very similar in many ways. However, right. in Mumbai, we have been locked down completely. We are not allowed to exercise outside. It's a pretty strict lockdown if you follow the rules. 
So how has your life changed and your relationship with the public space uh, uh, changed in these times? And, yes. you know, you can do on what Nidhi is saying as well. Yes, it has uh, completely changed. I'm a senior citizen and I used to take early morning walk between 6 and 7 every day uh, near one of the uh, lakes uh, in my suburban city of Thane. Uh, either I go, used to go to a lake and take um, walk around it for uh, at least an hour or I used to go near a park uh, very close to my house and uh, it's along the highway. But in the morning, it used to be quiet. But I'm missing that completely. I haven't ventured out. And from my house, I can't see any public space, any public road, because it's little inside the lane and it's very, very quiet. So I'm enjoying the quietness. There is no ambient sound at all. And I can hear birds chirping, I can hear, but I can't see anyone except my neighbors from my balcony on one side and other side there is a window, so just chatting across the building. So I think that space in between uh, for talking is uh, there, uh, though we can see each other, we can't, uh, our voices don't reach. So we talk on the phone but see across the balconies and windows so it's very funny in uh, some sense but uh, i think that's the best we can do and not venture out at all uh, though every corner shop is around i i didn't venture out uh, uh, for last 15 days except uh, for just a medical shop just 100 meters at the corner so I just picked up my medicine and came back. That's all. Nidhi, one of the things that have emerged during this lockdown is uh, all of us trying to create new spaces for community interactions. You know, we've seen all over the world how citizens are coming out to their balconies and windows to, you know, clap and kind of appreciate our frontline workers. You know, they're enjoying music together, sharing songs across buildings and above streets. Uh, it's nice to see this animation in uh, public land. What do you think? I think it's fantastic. We're very, we're a very resilient species and we often forget about that. Um, and the other thing that we forget is how much we need to be social. You know, the, the idea, especially living in the US for the past 10 years, you see several communities that are very sprawling, very suburban, people live further away from each other and you, you forget that you need to see people, you, need, you forget that you need to hear people and you realize how important that was only when it's taken, taken away from you. So I think people are realizing how important our public spaces were, how important it is for us to be able to see other people. And we're finding really creative ways to, um, you know, to make that connection happen, to find that social tonic that all of us need. People are posting signs in their windows. I, for one, like, I have my blinds drawn up all day. I'm not closing them. I want to see what's happening outside, even if it's very little bit of activity. I want to see that. And it's also showing us the things architecturally and from urban design that we forgot about. You know, the importance of having a stoop in front of your house where you could sit because it's it's great distance. You know, you're more than six feet away from your neighbor, but you have the comfort of sitting on the steps and actually having a conversation. You have the comfort of actually seeing the beautiful flowers that we completely missed. You know, spring's here in New York. I cannot go outside and enjoy the flowers in the ways that we wanted. We know that, you know, Jane Jacobs said that they were important. She always talked about the stoop life and all that. But slowly we forgot how important it was because we had the luxury of walking on our sidewalks. We had the luxury of going out and sitting at a park. And we forgot all the little ways in which each independent individual and their private realm contributes to the public realm. So it's showing the importance of the facade. So all of that is really coming in. So this creativity is really, I think it's really something fantastic. And we'll see a lot more of that. My hope is that this creativity would go on when we are allowed to go out. We will continue to play our role from our private realms to make the public realm great because the public realm is our shared resource. That's very interesting, Nidhi. Um, 
you know, there are two things out here. So one is the public space and one is the private space where in today's COVID-19, we are looking for some kind of community interaction within our private space, especially in cities like uh, where there is a very strict lockdown. Mm -hmm. uh, so Lakshna, you know, you know that in Bombay and many other places like dense cities, we don't even have balconies. Many houses, many apartments have enclosed their balconies. So you don't really have that uh, space to, you know, uh, to actually sit out like a terrace or a balcony yeah. where you fresh yeah, air the sun. Know. And now it's been like two or three weeks where, uh, you know, I've been socially distancing since 8th of March. The lockdown was uh, enforced from the 25th of March. So more than a month, I've been completely indoors, exercising indoors with very little sunlight. Uh, you know, what? so that is one aspect I'd like you to touch upon. The second aspect is also, unlike New York, uh, I mean, I love New York. I think it's a very walkable city. And Bombay definitely is not a walkable city. It's not a cyclable city either. And you don't have that many parks. And if you do have the parks, you know, you have these tiny little green spaces called Nana Nani parks. Nana Nani is like grandmother, grandfather parks, which are just these empty spaces that they've converted into a little walking park. But, uh, you know, it's very interesting now when you think about who those public spaces were meant for, who were they designed for, were they actually being used by women, for example, or were, was it used only by men? And were they, you know, very democratic in their approach? And the second bit is really in your private space, how do we design more of these spaces, these community spaces that can be used? in times like this yeah what uh, what um, what i'm experiencing in uh, sitting at home and imagining spaces be, uh, beyond my home what i'm thinking is that ours is a slightly different configuration of settlement we have small plots and one building standing uh, in each plot and uh, there are compounds in between and uh, most of the spaces are occupied by cars because our buildings are quite old, 30 years old. We don't have parking spaces in the basement or in the stilted area. And uh, so most of uh, the time, the streets, uh, when people uh, take out their cars, the streets uh, are used by children for playing, either cricket or in the night they play or they run around. And I'm missing that. So I was thinking that just how to remove the cars and all the spaces in between our not very tall buildings, we are just ground plus three storey uh, buildings or two storey buildings. The spaces in between could be so well designed for children, for us to sitting out because we don't, we don't go out, only we meet on the streets, but we have no space to sit on the bench. So I was thinking that uh, we just convert few of the streets into uh, private open spaces among uh, for the building and because we are uh, enclosed, uh, we are not a gated community, but uh, you know it's a different configuration. But I think it's it can be doable, and we can have semi-private spaces or uh, semi-public spaces by simply removing the cars and merging the small 10 feet open spaces between the buildings with the street and uh, creating a nice ambient uh, spaces at this 100 meter stretch of a street. I'm imagining one can always design for people and for children and for people like me now that I have become a senior citizen, I miss that going out and sitting in the park. Earlier when your life is very busy, you don't miss so many things. Uh, but now I, I can understand how going out is so important. And I have to exercise on the terrace. Luckily, I have a terrace on top of my flat. But it's not small and uh, these tiny spaces are, of course, uh, just uh, you have to accommodate. But 
but one can think of designing and making them look spacious, green, and people oriented and attractive for people and children. That's what I was thinking all the time sitting at home. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually double down on the streets, like streets. Yes, absolutely. That's majority of our public spaces is our streets all around the world. That's the one thing we have in common. 80% of all public space in New York City is given over to movement and storage of cars. And it's, it's just, it's a space that we don't always remember that is public space because we think it has one distinct function, which is to move cars from one point to another. The real function is to move people. The real function is for people to occupy, and we have to think about it at that, like that, and we have to remember that that's our that's our public space. So streets is where the biggest opportunity is. Most of us have access to to that. I am very aware of places where we don't have streets, um, and I I understand that. But in in the parts of the world that we're talking about currently, especially in New York, we all have access to a street and that's our most prominent opportunity. Um, and at the same time, we're also doing, um, you know, the basic functions that I said that people are doing here, going to their grocery store, going to their pharmacy and stuff like that. So those basic functions rely on using your street for connectivity and getting there. Um, and I, I saw that there was a comment about uh, Tampa, Florida and, you know, thinking about Tampa, Florida and thinking about New York City. Um, there are some places that feel like there's plentiful space, but it's not space that is open for you to occupy. If you stay in those spaces, it feels like you're loitering. Why does that term even exist? What we should learn from COVID-19 is more and more places that people can actually occupy and stay in and think of that as lingering instead of loitering. So we have to make our streets more open, more available for public consumption, for public use, everything else that they need to do except the movement of a private thing, movement of, of you know, a, a vehicle. There are all these other things that street do. They literally connect us. So we have to rethink them as connectors of human fabric, connectors of the built environment, and not as conduits. So I just wanted to take the opportunity and double down on that automobile, uh, you know, premise uh, comment there. And, and that is really a very valid point, Nidhi. As you are aware, I work on sexual violence, uh, prevention, especially in public spaces. And in fact, we are partnering with Stop Street Harassment on their anti-street harassment week. It's the 10th anniversary campaign in uh, beginning on the 19th. And it brings back the, the point that if streets are so important to the sense of community and we are underutilizing it, how can we then ensure the safety of women and other vulnerable communities, because clearly, you know, these public spaces uh, are not necessarily used to loiter or linger. There's a whole why loiter movement in India, you know, by Shilpa Fatke and Samira Khan. And, um, you know, where they encourage women to just be in public spaces, because that's not the norm in India. Um, they don't use public gardens. They don't use, I mean, we have very few benches anyway, but mm -hmm. you don't uh, necessarily loiter or linger. And it's not seen as a uh, thing that a good woman does and then invites, uh, uh, you know, commenting and um, other forms of violence. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, as you go, you traverse the city, whether you're walking or taking public transport, you're open to all kinds of uh, other forms of uh, violence. So how can we think about, uh, you know, making sure that these streets are accessible, not just for in times of crisis or, but in everyday life that everybody has a right to these spaces and that they can be, you know, we should encourage that lingering. I'd like you to build on that some more. Yeah, happy to. And we can have a whole other live cast just on that topic. It'll be it'll be so great. Um, first of all, I just want to challenge anybody who thinks that women shouldn't be in public spaces, women shouldn't be in streets. Not true. We're equal citizens. We're 50% of the population of this world. To say that half of the population of the world doesn't deserve the same access to their public space, public for, for the entire population, doesn't deserve access or doesn't deserve to use it is total nonsense. That's not true, that should not be the case, and that is just not how we should be thinking. And I think in terms of turning things upside down a little bit, 
for centuries, if not longer, we haven't given women the same access. That is the problem of people who've designed our cities. And most of the books that we read and most of the planning manuals that we follow were written and created by men. Obviously, men don't know what women need, to, need in their public spaces. Men don't know what makes women comfortable because they're not in our shoes. So they don't know that. Um, so in order to turn that upside down and flip it on its head, we need to put women in positions of power. Women need to be writing these books and manuals and these, uh, these guides now. Um, and how would we incorporate that when, while we're working on getting women in positions of power and making sure their voices are heard, we need to start making sure that their voices are heard through every public process, every planning process that we undertake. So let's ask women, young girls and women, let's ask them what it is that makes them feel comfortable. And we don't have to ask them what it is that makes them feel comfortable in the street. We need to ask them, what is it that makes you feel comfortable in general? And then use our skills as urban planners, architects, and designers to figure out how do we translate that sense of comfort, those elements of comfort into the design of the, of the street. Um, I see that happening all the time that people go and ask, what would you like to do in this park? And what would you like to do um, in the street that would make you feel comfortable? If somebody has never used a park or a street comfortably, they don't know how to answer that. They don't know what to say to that. And that's all, either considered ignorance or lack of ideas. That's not what it is. Let's just ask them in general, what it is that you like um, to, to do in your free time, what it is that makes you feel comfortable, and let's use all of our collective knowledge to translate that into um, how our streets and public spaces are designed. And let's start there. And at the same time, let's get women in the positions of power, in the positions of autonomy, where their voices can be heard. It'll take a lot of elevating those voices really high to get to some sort of an equilibrium. We're far from it right now, as I'm sure all three of you know. Yeah, I'm gonna take a. I want to take a moment to uh, just kind of note that we are truly in the era of the digital public square today. And I just yes. want to kind of share that uh, there's there's a ton of people who've joined us. And uh, there's Katur from Indonesia, Ruchi Verma from Delhi, New Delhi, and who's been joining us regularly. Arvinda from Brinda, uh, Pascula from uh, Pasula, sorry, from Mumbai. And uh, I'm going to take a question at this point in time from Camila Chapella, who's from Tampa, Florida, uh, who's, who's asking us a question about how will COVID-19 uh, impact public space use, design, and governance uh, in the future? So Lakshana, do you want to come in on that? Yes, uh, I, I hope and I think we have to work very hard in Mumbai and in suburbs to see that women have better uh, places, better spaces to walk. Most of the women walk in the city in Mumbai and uh, they, can, they, they have to drop the children to the uh, schools, they have to take them to the market and there are no uh, sidewalks, there are no footpaths. And uh, well, uh, along the edges, all the cars are parked, and women and children they really have to juggle with the juggle with the parking spaces and the uh, scooters and two wheelers and uh, uh, other people walking. It's really huge, crowded streets, very uh, near the stations, near the markets, near the schools and uh, everything has been taken over by vehicles and our uh, municipalities and our uh, elected members are not even concerned for the people uh, who, who are walking. 80% of people in our cities walk. Either they walk to the station, they go to the bus stop, they go to the markets, but every street, every lane is full of cars and full of vehicles. And these two wheelers, they are uh, they are like uh, big threats to life and children, to women, to old people. It's really difficult to cross a street, even 20 feet street, difficult to cross, to go across and get an auto or to go somewhere. It's, it's really tough and we really need to consider uh, people and women at the center of the whole design in our neighborhoods, in uh, spaces around our stations, 
spaces around the parks, whichever small parks we have. And uh, really, uh, we have to, uh, we are not as lucky as in New York to have broad sidewalks where you can walk with the children, with the uh, baby, uh, uh, babies around. It's really, really tough for women. And I see the poor women from neighborhood, uh, from slums, from crowded chores. That's the only outing they have or when they drop the children to the school or go to the market. And the spaces they walk, uh, they go around are so very uh, insecure. They're not at all secure. They're, uh, they're always scared for their life. Uh, their limbs. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's it's really tough in Mumbai, and we will have to, as architects, planners, we really need to have a big movement. Now, after uh, this COVID-19, we realize that people uh, need walking spaces, and we don't need so many cars. We need to convert all our roads into public uh, 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 vehicles, uh, only buses, only bus lanes. And our no footpath or very narrow footpath policy has to be abandoned as soon as possible. And we must have footpaths, footpaths, footpaths. I think that is what would be our demand in Mumbai or uh, should be. Um, I actually, Maybe. yeah, I was actually, I was gonna add that that's how I got started in doing what I what I do. Um, the this sort of this career trajectory that I'm on right now has been relatively short. I've been doing this work for the past 10 years. Um, and one of the experience that really got me to do this was um, I was in Delhi before moving to the US and my nephew who is old enough to now understand what it is that I'm saying, um, he was three something at that time and he had started walking. He wanted to be autonomous. He wanted to walk on his own. Uh, and we went for a short walk to the, to the market and um, I remember that when it was time to cross the street, it was it was not a very wide street. It was a narrow street. Um, I asked him if I could hold him, if he wanted me to hold him um, to cross the street. And he said, no, he said, hold my hand. I want to walk on my own. And I was being very careful. I was protecting. I was in front of him, shielding him. And we were trying to cross the road at non peak hour. And then I saw a car in the far distance speeding and not stopping seeing us. And I swept him up, but in that moment, my heart stopped. Like this was probably the most important little kid in my life. And I, he was in harm's way. And it's just, that's just how our streets are in non-epidemic and non-pandemic. And I don't, I don't see how this is not a wake up call. Right now is not a wake up call that we need our most vulnerable people, citizens, humans to feel safe. And that's what really public space is for. That's, it's the most, it's the most neutral, most safe ground there should be in a city. And it's, for a lot of us, it's the most unsafe place. And as you know, in India, we have a lot of people who actually live on the streets and who, um, you know, I mean, COVID-19 is exposing the fault lines in um, most of our policies, in fact, you know. Um, so Anthea Fernandez has this question. For many of us, we are privileged to have a private and public space. Could you speak to how we include those people whose private space is the public realm? Would love to hear your thoughts. And uh, this is a recurring theme that's coming up, you know, the informal economies and the informal, informal labor in um, these mega cities, uh, which rely on many of these people for the functioning of our economy. Right. Maybe, um, this yeah, I actually don't have a, a balcony or a stoop either um, but I'm, I'm very privileged to have windows um, and I have windows that face the sun and I get the sun. I completely understand uh, the idea of inequity and in access and I think COVID-19 shown us even in cities like New York that people think one of the wealthiest places in the world of course it is uh, we are seeing that there is a vast majority of the city's population that doesn't have access at, at all to public spaces. So in terms of changing long-term policy and learning from COVID-19 
we need to be thinking about how can we create many public spaces. Um, they can be small, but how can everybody have access to a public space who do not have other kinds of privileges? Because again, people need to survive, people need to get out, people need to see their neighbor, people need to start a business for the informal vendors. They need to have a space where they can do that and they need to have that space not that far away from them. So the idea of a park within five minute walk of everybody should become a policy worldwide. We need to think about those things. And that doesn't mean just the big parks. I'm talking about the really small, really neighborhood scale public spaces. They need to be plentiful. And we also need to be thinking about how do we start to reclaim the space that we know is not being used in the best possible way. Like thinking about um, yeah. spaces that are extra from, from automobiles, the extra asphalt. We, you know, every time it snows in New York, uh, people can kind of see where the snow doesn't get disturbed by cars, but there is asphalt underneath. So we've given that space over to cars, even though even cars don't need it. So how do we double down on the process of reclaiming uh, portions of our public realm that are, that are given over to a use that is not the most essential, that is not the, serving the most people, and definitely not serving the most vulnerable people with marginalized, with least access, how do we reclaim that? And reclaim that in a way that now it immediately responds to the needs of the people whose needs have not been met, who do not get representation in our public spaces. Those kinds of policies would be really important coming out of this. Um, and another thing I wanna say is, uh, thinking about the more vulnerable people with least access, there will be a very strong moment to come out and heal together and come together and rise together as a community, as a people, as citizens of this planet. And public spaces would be very important in that recovery. And we are just as strong as our most vulnerable uh, dweller of a city. So if we have to come out of this, we have to give the most vulnerable people the biggest opportunity to recover and heal and it's very it'll be very important for public spaces to become that place where that healing occurs i uh, i just want to point to a couple of comments uh, that are coming in uh nancy from egypt um uh, is asking us if this continues longer do you think people will go for privatization of spaces to join the outdoor uh, this is a question that's also uh, asked by Arvinda, who's pointing to the diminishing size of outdoor spaces in India's apartments, right? That's the only connection between, uh, uh, you know, apartment dwellers and the public realm at this point. Uh, so, Lakshana, do you want to kind of comment on that point? Uh, how yeah. should, in hyper dense cities, how should we be looking at giving access to outdoor spaces to our communities? Uh, will this have a long term impact in terms of privatization of public realm, which comes with its own set of challenges? Yes, yes. especially in Mumbai, when we see the old Charles, they had the semi public spaces in the form of long and broad corridors, as broad as 10 feet uh, wide. And these broad corridors were uh, semi-public spaces for people to interact, children to play, run. Even uh, sometimes uh, the guests used to sleep uh, at night on these corridors on uh, foldable beds. And what uh, the public housing is doing at as of now, is they are removing these broad uh, public uh, balconies, uh, which used to be uh, very, very important in the lives of people in the name of efficiency and in the name of uh, 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 sort of uh, saving the economic cost. And they are putting all people into tiny apartments and uh, without any corridors or if the corridors are there they are loaded on both sides they are very narrow and uh, no one can use them at all they are not even ventilated they are not even lighted and they are not really safe and the buildings are getting taller and taller and densities are crossing anywhere between 600 to 900 tenements per yeah. hectare I mean, no one has heard and people and the government is designing for these kinds of stupid, stupid densities for uh, uh, for the people in the name of affordable housing. They are making this extremely poor, uh, poorly ventilated, poorly lighted um, ghettos 
in the twenty-five story tall with just single window, no ventilation, and people can't afford even fan running all twenty-four hours. And women are sufferers; they are suffering from TB. Now it is COVID. I mean, this pandemic. I'm all the times worried about what's happening with those slum and people, uh, project affected people, housing in Mumbai. They were already suffering from more than 10 to 15 percent tuberculosis in those uh, rehoused areas. They were suffering from a uh, uh, lot of pollution in chemical pollution near the factories. And this is something we need to do urgently in Mumbai and address uh, as community uh, of architects, planners, urban planners. Somehow we have to press upon the authorities that this is not the way to design and do the building. I mean, we should ban all the architects who are really able to design this without any conscience. These are, uh, these are not the architects. They are not the professional architects. They are professional, I think, tomb makers. I, I will call them tomb makers. They have no sense of responsibility towards public life, public health, public safety. Nothing is there. I mean, hundreds and thousands of houses, uh, buildings constructed and in the pipeline to be constructed. And we have been challenging this. Uh, I mean, uh, I've gone to the High Court with uh, public interest litigation. I'm waiting to, uh, uh, waiting, uh, this, this will come up very quickly in the High Court after this pandemic. For one year, I'm waiting for the courts to take up the case. Now, I hope it comes up quickly as soon as the courts open and we are able to plea, uh, make our plead, uh, pleading to the High Courts that please, please stop this nonsensical building construction in the name of public housing, which is really a big killer by itself. There's a comment from Eugenie, who's from Amsterdam. She says, as cities are fighting against this pandemic and many turning to the help of tech, how do you think smart city approaches or tech can be can help the revival of public spaces afterwards? And I'm going to direct that to Nidhi. Yeah, actually, I've, I've answered this question a few times since we started talking about this. Um, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but I will say myself, using technology for every conversation I've had in the past one month, oh, it's not the same thing. It's not the same. I miss being able to see people face to face. Um, and the individual, like single person, single screen interface and consumption, it's taking a toll on me. You know, my, my mental health, it's, it's much more exhausting to me than having a one-on-one -on -one conversation in a conference room with somebody or on a park bench with somebody. So it's it's a tricky relationship that we have to manage. And I think we we should be, many of us should be realizing that individual consumption of tech is not really the best for our psychological and mental health going forward. And COVID has shown us how important psychological and mental health are as a contributor to our overall health um, in addition to physical. So what we need to be thinking about leveraging tech for is the collective good in a city, like not thinking about one person kind of screen, but thinking about a screen that invites and almost mandates um, participation by multiple people. How do you, um, you know, have an interactive display that requires three people to kind of interact and three people to play so that while they're interacting with technology, gaining information or just, you know, for recreation, they also have the opportunity to see each other and interact with each other. Maybe the person next to you interacting with the same screen is from a totally different walk of life than you. And that way you've created this opportunity for people um, to learn from each other and build sort of more understanding of different types of cultures, different races, different uh, ways of living and so on and so forth. So we have to think about leveraging tech for the collective good. Um, same goes for, you know, everybody's talking about autonomous vehicles and autonomous technology and all that. I have to talk about it because everybody is. So how do we leverage autonomous technology for the collective there as well? How do our buses get autonomous before our cars get autonomous, you know, so that people already drawing, you know, using buses for their livelihood, drawing a lot of social benefits, cognitive elements, from using public transit now have the better technology available to them first. So in every aspect of using tech in the public realm, 
think about how it benefits the collective and the city first. And let's move away from this individual consumption um, method of using and leveraging tech. There are two comments. One is uh, from Katur from Ind uh, Indonesia, uh, who says, do we have to redefine the idea of making city become more compact? And I'm also going to uh, combine that with, um, who was it who said that, you know, uh, the idea of resilience, we are talking about these mega dense cities where it's hard to implement things like uh, social distancing, especially during a pandemic. And that could also be one of the causes of the spread of the disease. So are we advocating for, you know, resilient cities to be smaller in size, less dense in size? Um, your thoughts, Alakshana? Um, see, the densities, of, uh, thinking about densities of cities, in the western suburban, uh, especially the American densities are extremely low, so you don't see people. On the other hand, in cities like Mumbai or in some parts of Delhi and other places, the densities are so high, so high, so high, that you wish people are removed from public spaces or they share, time share the public spaces somehow. Probably whatever small little uh, uh, green spaces we have, they tend to get crowded because in the morning, uh, everyone tries to uh, walk around them and uh, then they're extremely crowded and uh, you really can't jog on those uh, tracks, whatever they are, because they're extremely crowded. Now, can we do time sharing with help of technology of these available small spaces? Can we do a sort of a self-regulation, self-planning for using this like certain hours reserved for certain localities and certain people or children and only the old people go in some places at certain times and not other times. I mean, uh, we have so much short of space. We don't have even one square meter of open space per person in Mumbai. At places, it's not even 0.5 square meter per person. So how do you how do you see the uh, crowding and the densities in Mumbai are really killing? And density, low densities uh, are not our problem. Extremely high density, extremely high crowd, extremely high congregation, and people tend to have in every place, in train, in buses, in streets, and markets. It's, it's somehow we have to reduce the congestion, we have to reduce the crowds, we have to um, enforce um, um, uh, lesser densities of, on our cities and really come up with solutions of uh, uh, sharing the spaces uh, in common um, uh, with the luxury apartment. Now, uh, why can't luxury apartments uh, have the service apartments for their uh, watchmen, their maids and their drivers and their uh, gardeners in their own complex? They want everyone to stay in slums and they, they enjoy the luxury of the gated communities. I think that should also be looked into as far as the housing is concerned and public really is concerned and uh, we are really concerned about now Now, at least rich people will realize how how poor people are suffering. At least they are seeing in, on TV and uh, other places when they don't have even a space which is necessary for social distancing. How do you do social distancing in 10 by 10 square foot, 10 square feet? A hundred square feet room and it's shared by uh, six, seven people and even kitchen is there and the bathroom is there and uh, all these people are sitting together in a crowded condition. What do you make our sense out of it? I, I, I think the density debate has to be extended beyond the suburban and less or more density. There should be healthy density. And there should be healthy densities as far as the climate, as far as the uh, cities are concerned. And how to do it, how to make the rich people pay for the, uh, the, the way they have been building uh, huge houses 
in cities like Mumbai, 24 story house for a single family, it makes no sense. I mean, it could be just converted into a big hospital or a big school. I mean, they don't uh, they don't make sense to me at all. How 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 we are allowing this kind of disparity in our cities? It's it's something which which needs to be uh, done by the um, um, Indian architects and planners and urban designers. We we really have messed up with our cities in the last 50 or 60 years. We need to look into everything right from the first rule of planning. That's what I think. Uh, and speaking from sort of the, the American perspective here and thinking about, because a lot of this question, a lot of these questions come up here as well. Um, is density really, really good? And um, in there has been a lot of anti-urban sentiment re recently as well. I've heard from people: um, Is you know, is New York the answer, or is LA the answer, or is it Phoenix the answer? Do people need to live away from each other? We cannot forget in this time. We cannot forget that there's a bigger emergency that we are all dealing with: climate change. And that is causing a lot, a lot of disruption in our daily way of life. Um, in the US, the biggest contributor of greenhouse gases um, is transportation, the transportation sector. When we have to move things between places, when people live so far away from each other, transportation is the biggest contributor of greenhouse gases in the United States. And the United States is the bigger, biggest contributor of greenhouse gases in the world. So the biggest contributing country, the biggest contributing sector is transportation. And what makes it so large and what makes the footprint so large is the fact that people live so far away from each other. And that is what is causing climate change. So think about COVID and the COVID emergency we're facing throw a flood on top, throw a hurricane on top. What will people do when they live far away from each other? You're moving further away from hospitals, you're moving further away from critical um, services that you need, you're moving further away from being a resilient community that can wash, you know, in instances that where you know your communities are at highest risk. And systems that make a city resilient, systems require um, density. You know, your your Instacart deliveries, people's home deliveries of food and restaurants and all that, where they're confined to their homes, those systems require density to be viable, and which is why density is not is not the problem here. Um, and the other thing that we can't think about is the point that Selakshana pointed out. If we can learn from COVID in terms of how can we make density work better, those of us who have the privilege of having a nine to five work day who can also work from home and whose life is is like not tied to a 9 a.m. start, how can we start to shift our working days? How can we start to release a little bit of pressure on our systems to not crowd the subways at the same time as all the essential workers need to be getting um, to their work? So how can we shift the nine to five days to just ease the pressure a little bit? How can we make sure that people are not putting up big, you know, big walls between their um, their compounds and the street outside, how can we make sure that there's more perforation? How can we make sure that there's more of a dialogue between the public and private space? So we start to, again, like a, thinking of a pressure cooker, because you know I am a pressure cooker user, how can we start to relieve some of that steam on our urban systems and just make it work better because we need density for the planet to exist? So which crisis would you rather solve? The bigger fish of climate change or the I'm not going to call it a small fish because I personally am privileged to not have faced um, any uh, any of the harshest uh, impacts of COVID. But in this moment, let's also remember that there is a bigger emergency that's facing all of us. Thank you. That this is this is a very fascinating and uh, vibrant discussion. Uh, I want to take a moment to uh, invite. Uh, one member of our community who's been following us uh, from day one. This is this is week two of our inclusive cities series. Uh, Nyango has been, you know, a key member of this community, and I am quickly going to invite him to comment about the public space within his city, and also, you know, pose question to our uh, guests. Yes, uh, can you hear me Yango, all right? Hi. Hi, yes, yes we um, can hear you. Good uh, morning. Yango is a okay, social good. innovator from New York. 
Yes, um, that's uh, accurate enough. And uh, first, I'd like to make a few uh, comments. So uh, one is the distinction between uh, crowding and density. So as to your uh, point, this Lakshana, you are likely uh, referring to crowding as opposed to density here. So you can, for example, you take New York's uh, Upper East, Upper West Side, you have very high density, but very low crowding. And then if you go back a century to New York's Lower East Side, when there were the tenements, the recent arrived immigrants, Strivers Row, as they used to say, then you have a very uh, no high rises, low rise, but high crowding. Or you can have both in the case of many of the housing states in Hong Kong, for example, both crowding and density. So I'd say it's an important distinction to keep in mind, given that it's not really crowding's issue, but rather density's issue, but rather the crowding. And to that point, uh, just for this chat this morning uh, here locally, it was going through a piece by another urbanist, uh, originally from New York. Uh, he's in uh, Berlin right now. His name is Alon Levy. Check out his uh, writings at the pedestrianobservations.com. Very valuable, very in-depth. And he used data from Germany, one of the few places where there's actually comprehensive and representative testing for COVID-19. And what they found through analysis based on that versus population census data is, as far as Germany is concerned, there is actually no conclusive difference between urban density and the level of infection. And what's even more striking is that the main international business hub, Frankfurt of the country, has one of the lowest infection and death rates in the entire country. So that's something to uh, keep in mind. And so uh, in terms of both your points about uh, inclusion and inclusivity and such, first uh, to uh, Nidhi and then to Lakshana, you can uh, bring this in as well. So having spent extensive time, obviously, in both cities, is in terms of getting public spaces in, something I've been uh, considering is what if to get public space, get these in these small parks, could those potentially be tied with things like conditional zoning bonuses and tradable development rights. So not only are you getting those amenities in, but you're increasing the supply of housing units to both, of course, increase beneficial density, but also the crowding are all more affordable. So just um, some of your perspectives on that. So is there any way to really bring private developers, private sectors, into um, this uh, initiative, these initiatives and campaigns to enhance access to public spaces, such as the five minute walk to a public park, for example. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. I think private sector is is critical. Um, not that we should give them a free reign, but private sector is critical. Um, I am also, you know, I'm a, I'm a social impact professional. I am currently enrolled in a coursework to sort of study social impact much more. And anybody involved in social innovation would tell you that it occurs at the intersection of the public sector, um, the impact sector, un impact sector being under which nonprofits, NGOs, and philanthropists fall, and then the private sector, the business sector. All three of them have to come together um, to efficiently solve any um, social problem that we're dealing with. These, both of them, access to public space, access to housing, they're both very uh, prominent social issues right now. So we have to think about private sector as, as an ally in making this happen. Um, what's important to keep in mind is, as we are thinking about giving private developers incentives for um, creating public space as opposed to, you know, uh, in return for creating more square footage that they can then sell, it's important to think about how would those spaces truly feel to be public. You know, there are lots of um, privately uh, owned public spaces in the US, uh, but oftentimes people do these really subtle things to make it feel like it's not really public. You know, changing the paving patterns, having a lot of cameras looking onto a space, presence of sometimes too prominent a presence of security, all these subtle ways in which uh, private entities kind of maintain and govern these private spaces that they've created for public good and, you know, as they say, but it doesn't feel public. And if it doesn't feel public, if it doesn't feel comfortable, then it's not truly a public space. You know, a project for public spaces has a diagram, you know, a four quadrant diagram of what makes a great public space. And one of those quadrants is comfort and image, because as a human species, if we're not comfortable somewhere, um, whether that is a 
conversation, a relationship, a, a space, if we're not comfortable, we want to leave as soon as possible. Why would we want to create public spaces um, that don't feel as comfortable? So it's really important to think about what are the ways in which we'll ensure that the spaces they create are actually serving a public good and not just because they were getting a tax break or they were getting um, the, the um, ability to build more and all these other ways. So it, the private realm, the private um, sector has to be reined in. There needs to be a little bit more regulation on that. And there needs to be a lot more community consultation to figure out what is that community's idea of comfort, because that also changes pretty significantly between every community. So while we think about letting the private sector in, we have to think about how do we empower the everyday citizen to be able to control what the private sector is doing or to be able to inform what the private sector is doing without giving them a free reign because it looks like they can solve a critical problem that we're not otherwise able to solve. So Lakshana, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, actually, I was thinking in uh, terms of, uh, 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 I was always thinking in terms of Indian cities. They are so very different. We really don't have public realm uh, in our cities. We have not even thought about, not even small uh, public spaces are small, uh, are public. They are always uh, private spaces, either they are uh, assured in by cars or um, uh, if they are uh, on the wider footpaths, they are, there are no spaces for hawkers. So the hawkers uh, encroach upon that. So public spaces are open for encroachment and protecting them as public spaces is a big challenge because of our densities, our large number of people. And uh, there is no sense of public uh, good in, uh, in with our authorities. They think every public good is uh, only to be made uh, private and not to be protected. And that is the way they think that it will be protected. But uh, then it doesn't remain public. It becomes private for few people. And public, a large number of people are deprived of any public open spaces where they can walk, they can go rest have some talk, have meet people. There are nothing like that. Uh, they used to be there uh, just uh, in villages. They, they used to congregate around a uh, big chowk or they used to congregate between spaces among the uh, small houses. Those spaces were very intimate, beautiful. Under the tree, they will say there the big uh, uh, round circle construction where people can um, uh, sit, uh, the children can play around and they can climb trees. All those uh, factors have to be brought into our cities, which, uh, which are completely lost. So I think uh, uh, another thing is that uh, we think of public spaces only uh, for enjoyment. But I think in India, all public spaces are used in so many multiple ways, like open, uh, uh, open uh, uh, grounds are converted into weekly markets for vegetables and farmers. And uh, uh, streets are converted into markets. Uh, so uh, we can't afford uh, single-use public spaces. But somehow we have to plan and organize and regulate the public spaces for multiple uses, for multiple people to share and enjoy and do even small business people, small uh, vendors, they can um, uh, have their uh, shops, weekly shops or whatever uh, markets. So we can't think of public spaces only as single use, entertainment uh, and uh, uh, environment spaces, but they have to be multiple use spaces and we have to creatively uh, apply our minds as architects and planners uh, by watching how people use our available tiny, tiny spaces. And unless we do that, uh, we, we don't think, I don't think we are going to get ready-made answers from uh, Western cities or other countries and other things. We, we need to have our own thinking and models for designing tiny or large public spaces for multiple users. Um, 
Yeah, I want to add to that. I think that's absolutely crucial to not think about public spaces as an optional use kind of place, as in one use kind of place. It serves multiple things. It has a life cycle of its own, whether that's thinking about the narrow markets next to Jama Masjid to thinking about, you know, Washington Square Park next to my office. They, they change during the course of the day. They serve multiple functions in addition to, you know, that optional use that if you had time, you could go there. They're essential. They provide enjoyment. They provide markets. They provide uh, social interaction. They provide a common place to have lunch if you work, you, you and your friends work in different offices, wanting to come together and eat food. That's, you know, that's where you go and sit together and eat food. So they're, they're much beyond this optional kind of use. And we have to be thinking about going forward. How do we create spaces that are flexible? That can be one thing today and be totally something else tomorrow because our needs are changing. Our climate is changing. Our problems are changing. So how do we build in flexibility in every form, yeah. form of design of our city so we can adapt and change? Just like the human species adapts and change, how can our built environment be something that adapts and changes to our changing needs? I know we're furiously getting tons of questions. I'm going to request our panelists to uh, answer the very specific questions on the uh, on our Facebook page later on. But I want to take a couple of questions which I think is uh, important to this conversation. One is uh, from Sher uh, Sherman Shafiq who is uh, asking us, will the pandemic change the design of our cities? Do disease shape cities or cities shape the disease? Nidhi, uh, Sulakshana, so does anybody want to kind of take that? Yes. Yeah. I think, uh, go for it. Uh, I think this COVID-19 COVID is definitely going to change the way we think of cities. I don't know how to how the change will be, and I can't predict the, what shapes our cities will take. But I think uh, in India, at least everyone will start thinking about cities as, uh, in a sustainable manner, as a, for design them for resilience, and not just look at them as economic spaces and. Uh, exploit to be exploited by for economic purpose, but they have to be human spaces. Cities have to become more human and more equitable, and that is what I hope after COVID-19. Because one of the questions was posed to me from media: Now with all these poor people are living cities. How will cities cope up with it? Now I said, you realize now all those uh, migrants were important to cities, but for last 60 years, have we taken care of the migrants? Have we constructed any proper houses? We are just uh, left them that we are saying no migrants should come. And now when migrants are leaving, people are worried now how our cities will be maintained. I think we have realized uh, our uh, elites have realized the value of the migrant people and henceforth at least they will take care that these people are very important. The, uh, our rack pickers, our uh, the, uh, solid, stay, uh, solid waste management workers, they have been neglected uh, in the city. So I think uh, that is one of the most crucial lessons COVID-19 has taught us uh, in, a, in a very shocking way. But I think that uh, this is always the case. The cities uh, and crowds uh, have been affected by pandemics. Uh, I, I remember London, so many places, yes. uh, and uh, they agree. have changed think, the uh, city. So, Lakshana, yeah. you're right. I think pandemics, the great fires, have shaped a yes. lot of the urban policies that we've yes. seen in the last few centuries. The, uh, yeah, you know, even if you look them. at the city of Mumbai. Uh, you know, it was if you look at the early days of how the city uh, looked, uh, yeah. you know, we did not have the drainage systems, we did not have the wide boulevard. So, obviously, the pandemics have had impacts uh, on the way the cities have uh, shaped. Nidhi, do you have comments on yeah. that? Absolutely, absolutely. I think the biggest thing COVID 19's done is what we said earlier it's shown us all the fault lines, it's shown us who has access and who doesn't have access, who, who has access to um, healthcare services, who has access to public spaces, who has access to anything outside of their, their tiny dwelling unit that they're in, especially even in New York. You know, this has been my experience firsthand. It's showing us all the problems, all the inequities that 
plague our cities everywhere. And it is so sad that it takes something like this to see that the poor person doesn't have access to the same things as the rich person does in their city. And the poor per person is more vulnerable to, to death and loss of life than the richer person just because their city failed to cater to them. So it's shown us the fault lines. The hope is that the fault lines that we now see will actually do something about plugging them in. In answer to who shapes whom here, Pandemics shape cities, absolutely, similar to what uh, uh, we were just hearing from Pratima. But what shapes disease is policies. Policies shape disease. Budgetary priorities shape cities. What, what do we spend our common dollars on? That's what shapes disease. If we focus on human well-being as opposed to GDPs and per capita income and other things, if our focus were human well-being, we would allocate our common resources very, very differently. So policies shape cities. If, if anything that we can see now from, from the United States and from New York, it's, it's not how our city was designed. It's how our money flows through that city. That's what's causing this disease to become what it is. And let's really not forget the power of advocacy, the power of the advocate, and the power of changing policy to reflect human need. That's it. That is what will help us come out of this and try to avoid spreading of the next one, because there will be a next pandemic. This is just the world we live in. And we don't even know the kind of pandemics that are headed our way because we don't even know the kind of planet that we're going to inherit it. This has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Mm -hmm. We've uh, spoken about private and public spaces, uh, the quality of public spaces, the, how they impact our lives, how they impact the quality of our lives, and what role does policy uh, have in shaping this. Um, this is the fourth session in our series of Inclusive Cities. I'd encourage you to come back uh, next Wednesday. Every Wednesday and Friday, we have these discussions. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Nidhi, Salakshna, and also Yangbo for joining us. Uh, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Pratima. Thank you very much. You know, the reason we are having these conversations is because we understand the importance of this moment it is a hugely disruptive moment for us to reflect on our collective future and uh, you know for many many years and decades we've had economists trying to get us to focus on human development index instead of just pure gdp and it, you know economic policies follow that agenda sent economic policy uh, is what we see cities kind of become. And I hope that this pandemic will allow us to kind of create cities that are more human and healthy and inclusive, because I think we're seeing all the fault lines emerge during this crisis. And I think that's the reason we are having these conversations, because um, it's really time to use this crisis to change our collective future. So we. We're doing this every week, uh, Wednesday and Friday at 6 p.m. India time and uh, 8.30 a.m. Eastern US, United States time. So, you know, please join us in this important conversation. Um, we are, you know, it's great to kind of have these diverse set of interactions, just rethinking everything. You know, a lot of our questions has been, is everything going to change post this pandemic? And I think, yes, it should. And, you know, let us kind of set that collective agenda. So we are, you know, building a planet, not just for people, but, you know, for our nature to thrive as well. And uh, please join us next week as well on uh, Wednesday. We have uh, one of my favorite people, Gita, Professor Gita Mehta. Uh, from Columbia University joining us and uh, continue to uh, have this conversation on our Facebook. Nidhi and Sulakshana, thank you so much for joining us today. Please answer all these amazing questions we've uh, uh, received today, a lot of whom we were not able to take during the live chat show. And uh, Yango, thank you so much also for joining us. It's one of the most wonderful things uh, about this has been, uh, a, you know, been about meeting all these amazing people in our newfound uh, digital public square. So thank you again, stay connected and uh, ask us more questions and continue these discussions in the online forum and join us every week 
uh, on uh, at 6 p.m. Wednesday and Friday, India time, 8:30 a.m. New York time. Thank you so much. Have a great day and week ahead.